Good morning, Mr. Will. Good morning, <clears throat> Rich. How you doing there, bro? I'm doing well. We got about six or eight inches and it's still snowing, so it's hey. kind of a rare morning here in Tennessee. Yeah, it's a blizzard for you guys. Yeah, my buddy Justin, who lives in uh, <clears throat> around Asheville, he sent me a picture. They got more than a foot. Wow. Yeah, those, those you guys aren't ready for that stuff down there. That'll shut everything down. Yeah, they closed portions of I-40 this morning, so mm. running through the state. <clears throat> we got one person jumping on so far. That is our good friend Tony out there in Brunswick, Georgia. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Tony. While we're waiting for people to jump on, Will, let's let's talk about our amazing sponsors. You know, here yeah. at the American Warrior Show on a beautiful Monday morning, coffee with Rich and Will. Uh, let's start out with Cool Fire, man. Can you tell us about the Cool Fire Trainer? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Cool Fire is awesome. It is a step up from Dry Fire. You take out your barrel, your recoil spring, put in theirs, charge it up with some CO2. When you pull the trigger, it's your trigger, your sights, your gun. You get some felt recoil. Uh, it's a it's a great way uh, to train new shooters as well. I've done that a number of times, like we've talked about before. You start them with some dry fire, go to some cool fire, go to some live fire. Gets especially if you got a hesitant shooter, um, it really helps them get past that. You know, this thing's jumping around in my hand because it, it's it's felt recoil, but especially if you let the CO2 charge come down a little bit first, it's it's not as as dramatic. I also see it as a safety thing because with that uh, cool fire in there, I can't get a live round into the gun by accident. Yeah, excellent. That's that's exactly right. So uh, please check out Cold Fire, but be, I mean, understand it's going to take a couple months to get it to you. Although I did an onboarding session for uh, a woman who just joined the American Warrior Society. Gosh, I guess it was Thursday. And that's something that we do. If you join the American Warrior Society and you get inside the training vault and you're overwhelmed with all the content, we will actually sit down with you. I'll, I'll call you and we'll spend an hour on the phone, get you acquainted with all the information that we have to offer all the training programs we have from low light to combatives white belt to blue belt mm -hmm. brazilian jiu-jitsu we've got edge weapons gosh well i mean yeah, uh, everything it's an astounding amount of information i mean there, there, there's a master's degree in kicking butts in there yeah so one of the reasons why people join is for uh, a really cool challenge coin you know everybody mm -hmm. who joins the american warrior society receives one of these guys mm -hmm. and it's a serialized coin relative that's for you. But anyway, so this young lady that <clears throat> joined the American Warrior Society the other day, we were talking and she says, yeah, it only took me like, I think six weeks to get her cool fire. So, which is uh, better than they, than they advertise. Will Parker has finishing up range master uh, certification this weekend with, uh, and he is, unfortunately we didn't get to get together, even though he's so close, but he's heading out to beautiful Montana. I have a safe travel today, sir. TC yeah, Fuller yeah. is on. Let's talk about Century Martial Arts makers of the Bob XL. Mm -hmm. Bob XL, the body opponent bag, extra long so that you can uh, do the leg kicks on Bob. Matter of fact, I think I told this story the other day. <clears throat> My son was having a difficult time with lapel chokes, and mm -hmm. we were able to take Bob off the stand, put him on the mats, wrap him up in a gi, and uh, demonstrate the proper choke without having to hurt either one of us. So yeah. another benefit. I don't think he was having trouble with the lapel chokes. I think he wanted to choke the old man. <laughs> Boy, you said it right, man. He loves choking me. Uh, so let me app yeah. APPHemp.com, Appalachian Standard, makers of the finest CBD products money can possibly buy. Uh, if you're into CBD, if you find that it's helpful with your sleep, if you're finding that it's helpful with your joints, if you're finding that's improving cognitive functions, please check out our good friends over at APPHemp.com. They have a deep discount for those that watch uh, American Warrior Show. And they are some absolutely fine people. I've served with Gunnery Sergeant Ross, who is now running Appalachian Standard. <clears throat> we also have Mountain Man Medical, man. Mountain Man Medical. I can't say it enough. You're far more likely to use those life-saving skills than you are those life-taking skills. Yeah, so absolutely. Pick up some kit from Mountain Man Medical. I think you and I were talking, Will, that we need to probably be replacing at a minimum some of those things that can dry rot and damage over time, right? Yep, quick clot, or what was that one you, you said? I, the name escapes me. Silox. Silox. Yeah, those, those <clears> expire, <throat> and uh, I remember the first time I I was going through mine, I went, hold on, what's this date here? And yeah, it was it was way out of date. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. Carry, carry lots of life-saving stuff. It, it, can, it doesn't have to be a, a self-defense thing. It'd be a car accident. Yeah, absolutely, man. So 
we got folks jumping on. Let's see. I got Jared says, Gilly, lots of vitamins. Keep pneumonia at bay. Don't sleep on your back. Keep an eye on your blood oxygen content. That is uh, that is true, man. I've had my youngest son and my youngest daughter has had COVID this past week. And thankfully, uh, I, me and my wife did not get it. And uh, but we've been really pushing fluids and pushing the vitamins. Doug is on. Dr. Gordon Botson is on. Good morning, sir. Who do we have left here? Will we have precision holsters, I believe. Yeah. Makers of the Ultra Appendix rig, which I wear. I, I put a little video of me wearing my Ultra Appendix. If you're a member of the American Warrior Society coin group, and I know about 800 and something mm -hmm. of you guys and gals are, you can check out my setup on our closed group. Uh, and I believe that is all. Will, tell us right. about today's show, man. Well, we're going to we're going to dig into uh, inflation from a financial preparation standpoint. So first thing, the big disclaimer, of course, we're not financial guys. We're not financial advisors. I'm just a guy with salon quality hair and a dream. That's <laughs> it. OK, so, you know, these take these. Every situation is different. Look, look at your situation, you know, and, and what your risk tolerance is, so on and so forth. Talk to some talk to a real financial planner. I'm. I'm bringing up ideas here and there's going to be contradictory ideas in some cases because that is not a one size fits all. And, you know, maybe do a little bit of everything because right now we really don't know which way it's going to go as far as severity. We all know the currency is going to continue to devalue because that's really about the only direction it goes. Uh, but we don't know how fast or how bad, and that can that can determine changes in the future. So we could today talk about, oh, this is a good idea, but in a month or six months, it, it could be a, a not the best idea. Yeah. So uh, you know, I know we'll talk about the currency devaluing at some point, but that is that is so true. And I know that you'll eventually talk about junk silver today. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll reserve that comment for later in the show. But I want to mm -hmm. just emphasize one thing that Will said. Neither one of us are. Uh, certified financial investors. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, uh, et cetera, re regional manager for disaster preparedness of the American Red Cross. Will is a captain for a major commercial airline carrier. So consider the source. However, mm -hmm. we're telling you kind of what we're doing, man. Yeah. And uh, with a, a little bit of qualified experience on this, because we've been investing in in the stock market, I know that I have since the 90s, Will. How about you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, about the same. Um, you know, it's amazing how far the ability to invest in the stock market has come. You know, so there's so much more information out there. And that's we're going to dig into a little bit of that that I've learned over the years. And and I want to hear what you've learned and how, how you've changed over the years with this and, and how we diversify that risk away from the stock market. Because as we're going to talk about later on with uh, uh, one particular asset class, it's highly manipulated. Oh, yeah. uh, and a number of them are, but this one, um, uh, this one, the an institution got caught and, and wrote a big check to uh, to uh, the government as punishment for that. So we'll get into that a little bit later on. All right, let's go for it, brother. All right, here we go. Uh, all right, so the first one, and it came up last week. Somebody asked a question about cash, cash money, how much to keep on hand. Well. Again, that this is going to be a sliding scale for everybody, right? Uh, but here, here's how I look at it in a, in a bigger picture kind of way, guys. Okay. Um, the, I, I say fixed costs, okay? Your mortgage is a fixed cost. Yeah, you know, if, if you escrow your property taxes and your insurance, those will change a little bit. But for the most part, it's a fixed cost. I'll, I'll say it's like 90% fixed, right? So... I like to think of it as in, not so much in dollars of cash at home, but how many months of cash at home? Are you comfortable with one month, three months, six months? What lets you sleep at night? Okay. So along with that is also your insurances, your car insurance, if you pay for your own health insurance or your copay on that, um, along with any deductibles you might be liable for. Uh, if, if the time you worked out such that, um, you know, you took a financial hit at the beginning of the year when you have to pay your deductibles and your co-pays like right now. Is there money in savings for that? Is there, do you, have, you want to, are you more comfortable having that cash at, at the house? Uh, your utilities are also relatively fixed. Uh, kind of look at your state. A lot of states have highly regulated utility companies. So they have, the utility company has to go to the state to get approval for a rate increase. Hmm. So if you watch the news, 
you can you can know when those rate increases are coming. And usually there's plenty of um, notice of those. So you can, again, 85, 90% call that a fixed cost. Mm -hmm. um, food also can be relatively fixed. Now, we know it sure isn't fixed in the last year, right, brother? No, meat, meat's going crazy right now. Yes, it is. But we can, even if it's 50% fixed, we'll get into later how to make that a little bit higher of a fixed cost with some food storage. Um, but we can get something put aside for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. And I, like I said, for those that weren't on here a few weeks ago, I was talking about, I, I get my beef from a guy about, I don't know, 400 yards from my house who has black Angus, grass fed, grass finished. They, these animals have never touched grain. And um, he's like, Rich, you know, we were going to split a cow. He's like, Rich, I, I can't do it. I'm like, what do you mean? He's because I'm looking at the field full of black cows, you know, and he said, mm -hmm. I can't get to a slaughterhouse. Everyone here in East Tennessee is booked up for 18 months because as the prices of beef are rising, people are going to these alternate sources for getting meat and they're stomping on my plan. Yeah. causing me distress. So, <clears throat> yep. which, which means when I, when my deep freezer start to run out of red meat, I'm going to have to go to the store just like everybody else. Yep. And in a way I think about stretching that out is, you know, the, what you just described was go from your freezer to 100% at the store. So then you're going to incur all that price increase all at once. So and what know, I should do is. Is buy a little, you know, you see something on sale, pick up a little bit, stretch that out. So, that you know, you still will stay within that food budget you're looking for. And you use that, that, that really good stuff you got sitting in your freezer to stretch it out. And that's exactly what my wife and daughter do. They do all the shopping around here. Proving yet again, they're smarter than us. <laughs> that's exactly right. Thank you to the 22 folks joining us. Uh, as we talked about, this is this is going to be a show on how, last week's show. If you haven't watched it, please go back and watch it. It was all the things you need to have on hand to be prepared in your home for an all hazards preparedness situation, whether it's a hurricane, a zombie apocalypse, a financial collapse, an EMP, God knows what life mm -hmm. throws at you. Today's show is going to be how to prepare yourself and your family for the financial risk that may be ahead of us. And again, just for the people that are coming on late, Will, Will and I are not financial planners. Take this for entertainment value, but please understand these are the some of the steps we're doing. We're not advising you to do anything that we're not already doing. Go yeah. ahead, Will. But yeah, and, and along those lines, what I really want to do is get people thinking about it outside of the standard box, because that's that's where people get trapped. And, and Jared brings up a good point. I just read an article recently about chicken wings going crazy on price and, and restaurants are starting to put uh, chicken thighs out there on the, on the menu now to try and control the, the output costs. I mean, it's some of the prices I'm seeing around the country and my travels for stuff are insane. Uh, I, I won't name the brand, but it was a bucket of chicken, 12 piece. I think it was $43. My God, $43. U.S. not pesos. <laughs> well, and, and you have a very good because uh, you're a commercial airline captain. You know, you get to travel all across the country, and you get to see some of the wackiness that is a, a bit more mm -hmm. regional some, than some other places. But yeah, and there are some places where you know cheeseburger, fries, and and a cold one. Uh, I mean, you can rack up 35, 40 bucks pretty quick. It's wow. it's insane out there. And um, so back to this. So. What I like to do is take and total up all those fixed costs that you have right now, even if they're the fixed costs, okay? Um, I like to have about three months worth of cash in the house. That gives me that reaction time, right? So that if something goes crazy, like a pandemic shutdown, hmm, um, that gives me time to just take a deep breath and go, okay, I can take a couple days here. I don't have to panic, you know, and, and work through this problem. Yeah. So kind of, kind of like keeping that guy at a distance at a gas station, right? That's exactly right. And, you know, that we we see this around the world, man, where they shut mm -hmm. off ATM machines. You can't get access to electronic currency. They they turn off parts of the Internet, man. And the ability to have cash on hand to keep, you know, to, to have space to maneuver for you and your family for yep. months ahead is a phenomenal advice. Absolutely. It's, it's a great idea. Now, that said, everybody, maybe somebody isn't comfortable having that much cash in the house. So now what? What do you do? Um, I will tell you, I've had two instances we talked about before, Rich, where I went up to a, a bank teller and said, I need X amount of dollars. And they went, oh, I don't know if I can give you that much. That, <laughs> that was that was my wake up call. I went, you know what? 
And uh, they went, no, we, we can't. Um, and then uh, they got. Well, here's what's funny about that, because I, I'm, I'm with you. I've moved around uh, with my father, you know, that we have some joint accounts and talking about six figure sums. They're mm -hmm. not prepared to give you that money. No. They're, they're prepared yeah. to hand you a cashier's check to move it to another bank. Right. But, but to say, no, 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 I want it all in a paper sack. I want to walk out of here with it. Yeah. Good mm -hmm. luck with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now with that said, you know, I'm not advocating only having one month or three months worth of savings. Um, but maybe somebody isn't comfortable having more in the house. So now what do you do with the rest of it? Okay. Well, there's a couple of ways to look at. Um, well, first let me back up a little bit. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. So where do you, where do I keep my cash and later on my precious metals? I keep them in one of those little safes, got a handle on it, like a briefcase, yep. fireproof safe st sits by the bed. If the house catches on fire, it goes out the window. Can we talk about that for just a second? Sure, because yeah. I, I, oddly enough, you and I were talking a couple of weeks ago. I do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. I keep my cash, precious metals, and I, I keep a USB with, uh, not a USB, but a, some USBs and a terabyte, whatever our storage is, you know, all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff that can be in there. There's a cigar box inside there that has extra keys to vehicles because if I throw it out the window, now it's going to have spare keys to the, to the mm. vehicle so that we can drive away. It's going to have my terabyte with everything. So I don't have to worry about running around and grabbing. If you have mm -hmm. pictures of ancestors that are long past, you might want to scan those, put them on your uh, terabyte so that when you jump out the window or have to jump to another country, mm -hmm. I mean, who knows, right? Uh, yep. What you might have to do, it, it's easy to do, and it's a fireproof, crush-proof container. I'm sorry to have a segue, but... No, no, that's awesome. Great and, you know, you say jump to another country, and people are like, seriously, Rich? Seriously, this is America? Well, mm -hmm. if I would have told you two and a half years ago, here's what I think is going to happen. You would have locked me up in the loony bin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, something to keep in mind, guys. I mean, it, 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 the, the probability is a number greater than zero. Right. Well, um, so, um, so where do we keep the rest of rest of our, our cash, our liquid assets? Okay. Um, actually, you know what? I'm sorry, Rich. I jumped ahead on my notes again. So, um, okay. so what other purpose is there for having cash on hand? I'm talking cash on hand now, you know, there's going to be opportunities that come up. I, I don't want to see anybody go through any hardship, but I've got a motto and that is that my kids eat first. Amen. And, that isn't just literally eating. It's like we, if I want something and the family needs something, well, I, my kids come first. So if somebody else gets themselves into a bad spot, I feel sorry for them, but I'm going to take care of my family. And so having some cash on hand, suddenly there's something I need. Pick whatever it is. Oh, it comes up on Facebook Marketplace because somebody's getting on, on the edge of being repossessed or they just got to raise some cash. Well, now I can come in there and go, hey, I've got some cash. Let me and, talk, let's, let's talk about that real quick. <clears throat> well, let, let I, me let me let me just throw one one example, and then I, I want to hear what you got to say. Now go for the, it, brother. So I was in the market for for an item, and it came out on Facebook Marketplace later on Saturday afternoon after the banks had closed. And this guy was pretty desperate, and I went in there and said, "I'll give you this for it." And it was about seventy five percent of his asking price. You, I could just tell the guy was desperate. And somebody else showed up and wanted to give him more, but he couldn't get cash till Monday. Mm. I had cash in hand. So I used my cash out of my emergency savings, got the item, got it home. And on Monday, I ran to the bank, pulled some cash out and refilled that. Yeah. That gave me the opportunity to save some money and better support my family. Yes. Yeah. What I was going to say is it's, it's not even necessarily about this topic, but it's more to the point you made about, you know, they, it was something like, you know, my kids get to eat first. I, I can't mm -hmm. help it that they weren't as prepared as we were. That's not my fault. And a friend of mine said, you know, they had a call out. He's a search and rescue guy. And okay. and they got, you know, I don't know, 10, 12 inches of snow where he lives in the mountains. And he, he said, you know, they got a call out that this guy with full knowledge of what the weather was coming, he gets hypothermic up in the mountains because he decided to go up there. And, and he's like, you know, on some level, you need to feel the consequences of your bad decisions. Mm -hmm. You're in some guys wrecked they were trying to get up there and help him and they put themselves at risk so mm -hmm. again i think your motto my kids eat first is important and everybody needs to hear that 
Yeah, I don't know where the, I saw the saying. That. It was probably some Facebook meme, to be honest. But, you know, stupid should hurt at some point. You <laughs> yeah. know, that's the only way I learned when I was a teenager in my 20s. It had to hurt. Uh, I wasn't necessarily bright at that age. Uh, and people might argue it at my age now. So, um, so uh, the other one, too, is opportunities will come up. You know, if you're looking for something, you're looking for uh, a home, you're looking for a boat, you're looking for a new car, new to, new to you. Get friendly with your banks. Um, they they know who the distressed borrowers are, mm -hmm. and so you know let's let's just say you're looking for a, a home for a rental property because you can raise rents as inflation goes up. So it's an inflation hedge. Um, so get, get friendly with with the loan officers at the bank and go, hey, I'm in the market for fill in the blank, and I can be a cash buyer or you know easily financed up to X. And then stay in contact with them about once a month. Just drop them a quick email. Hey, I'm still in the market. You got anything going? And you, two things are going to happen. First, the bank doesn't want to repo or foreclose on anything. It doesn't look good to their regulators because they gave a bad loan. They did a bad job, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want that. The other thing is the bank will lean on this person who is struggling and going, hey, you need to get rid of this or you're going to get foreclosed on. or You're going to get repo. You don't want that. So now you got the bank actually helping you with these purchases. So if, if you're in the market for something and, and have some time, take a look at that. I never would have thought of that. that. Hmm. So I like that. Uh, there's another one. I'll throw a website out there. If you're cool with it, brother, um, yeah. crank cranky ape.com cranky, like unhappy ape, a P E.com. It's bank repoed cars, boats, RVs, uh, that's where I got my fifth wheel trailer at, uh, when they weren't real well known, I got it for about 60% of blue book, uh, wow. sold it for five years, sold it five years later for what I had in it. Um, and they got, uh, locations all over the country and you can set up delivery. Uh, if, obviously if you're not near it, you can't see it, but they do a really good job of taking lots of pictures. Um, so I've, I, I go on there once a month and just see what's there. I like it. Um, so, um, you know, and if we're right about inflation taking off, you know, these, these people that don't have a lot of extra money, you know, when as the food prices continue up and stuff, there's going to be more and more distressed sellers out there. So having some dry powder, having some the ability to pay stuff, pay for stuff is there's going to be some opportunities out there. And of course, we can't stretch ourselves too far either. But if it's something you need anyway, like a new vehicle, well, you, you can take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, speaking of dry powder, man, that's... That may not be, you know, that's legitimate. <laughs> yeah, You're a, yeah. a lot of people watching or listening to us are going to be reloaders and they know how hard it was mm -hmm. to get powder and primers. Mm -hmm. yep. hard. I mean, it just got crazy there for a while and it's still yep. not back to normal yet. No. So now's the time to purchase that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Get, get what you can. And, and, you know, the prices are slowly coming down, but I mean, could you ever imagine paying almost 30 cents around for Russian steel case ammo? Hell no. No, I wish I would have bought pallets and nine mil at 16 cents around back when, it, when that was easily available. Well, and that's it. You know, we're, we're talking about stocks and precious metals and land and other assets, you know, a couple pallets of ammo, my God, mm -hmm. buy it when it's 18 cents around and yeah. you know, hold on to it or sell it when it's 50 cents. Yeah. Around. Could have retired off of that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about volatility versus risk. Okay. Um, this is one that, Honestly, it took me a long time to wrap my head around, Rich. Um, volatility and risk are not the same thing. No. Um, and it's the way I've learned to think of it is volatility, high volatility is what makes it so you can't sleep at night. Um, and risk is what makes you lose money. Okay. Yeah, so um, it, they're, they're intertwined, but they are separate. So, um, Rich, what, what do you suppose the best performing asset was from 2000? 10 to 2020. I think I know, but I don't necessarily. Yeah. Want to yeah, go ahead. Away. Go ahead. You can look smart. It's all right. Uh, brother. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It was oh. now it was volatile too. I mean, holy cats. How about you bring that, uh, that chart up there, brother? Yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's That's take a look at this chart here, guys. Look at the, oh, the, the other one, the, the other chart. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's all right. I had it on the right one to begin with. There you go. All right. So let's take a look here, guys. 
So this goes back to 2011. Look what it made in 2011, 1,473% return. Look, look a few years, la a few years later though, 5,507% in 2013. And then it dropped by over half in 2014. Mm. And then up, up, up 1,300% in 2017. And that's 73% drop in 2018. And so if you look all the way to the right, it's kind of covered up by the logo there, but it says 2011 to 2020 annualized 203% a year return. But it was wow. all over the place. Think, I mean, when it 2018, when it dropped 73%, I'm thinking sleeping at night would have been kind of difficult, right? <laughs> so, but now we go down. I mean, look at the next next best performing one, NASDAQ. That's 20% annualized. That's a blazing return in the stock market, but it's nothing compared to a much more volatile uh, thing like Bitcoin. And of course, Bitcoin also, uh, you know, it was new. So a lot of people are piling money in. So it's not entirely a fair representation. And it certainly isn't what it's doing now. Um, uh, I have my own thoughts on Bitcoin. I think it trades more like a commodity personally than an asset, but that's, that's a discussion for another time, probably. Um, you know, we can, we can work our way down through this and I don't know if you can link this chart in the show notes or not rich, but people can dig into it more later. Um, but this is also, I want to go down to the bottom here. The, the least volatile thing we can, we can have is cash, right, rich? That's right. A savings account. Every time you open it, it's either the same, or if you got your 0.001% interest that quarter, it goes up ever so slightly, assuming you don't spend anything, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at cash, second from the bottom, U.S. cash. Look what it did each year. Mm. And even the years when it was up, I mean, 2018 was up 1.7%. It was the only thing in that whole chart that was up that year, but I'll bet you inflation was more than 1.7%. Oh, that yeah, year. you know it was. And if you look all the way to the right on that, from 2011 to 2020 annualized, it was one half of 1% a year annualized. Mm -hmm. So the number is stable, but the purchasing power decreased over that time because of inflation. True. So stability does not mean no risk. In this case, it all stability did with, with the holding cash was guaranteed you lose money, mm -hmm. lose purchasing power. It's a guarantee. And now, instead of inflation being one and a half, two percent, like it was many of those years, I, I believe, now we're running seven percent. So, having a savings account is a guaranteed loss, but it feels good because the number stays the same; it doesn't move around. And this is the trap where a lot of people get into uh, because it feels good, right? It does feel good to, to to see it, but you're sitting on nothing, right? Actually, you're sitting on less less every single. Every single month, right? Exactly. Less purchasing power, right? So let's go to the next chart there. Okay. So this is one, this is a little gamble in here, guys. This is, I would not call this investing, okay? Buying Bitcoin in 2011 was not an investment. It was a gamble, in my opinion, okay? But you start with $1,000, and I won't bore you with the math. Um, but look what you end up with in 2021. 12 million bucks. A thousand dollar investment. My God. Okay. But also let's look at 2018 to 2019. It went from 14 mil to 4 million. Yeah. Owie. Who would have let that ride? Well, and that's, that's one of my ways when I do my investments is when, if something, you know, people ask me, well, why did this go down? I'm like, cause it went way up first. Yeah. So, you know, when, when something goes up like that, Pull some of that off the table. That's your hard-earned capital. Pull some of that off 20, the table. Look right? at that. Well, I mean, who in 2014 to 2015, how many people jumped out because they got scared? Uh, a lot. Yeah. You know, for sure. Uh, but this is also where I look at this, and I just threw $1,000 in there for round numbers. Make it 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. And right now you got, right now you'd have 1.2 million. Yeah. So, you know, I look at when these opportunities come up like like Bitcoin early on, I, the way I look at it now, I wish I would have looked at it like that then, but the way I look at it now is I'll throw a hundred bucks. I'll throw 500 bucks at it. Mm -hmm. And if it turns into something awesome, I'll see you on the Island. Right. <laughs> exactly. And if it doesn't, I'm not a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like buying lottery tickets. You know, um, my, my dad always called buying lottery tickets, a, a tax on people who can't do math. Exactly um, right. And, but I buy lottery tickets. It's, it's kind of fun. I can afford it. It's not you know, I'm not, you know, scrape, scraping up change in my cup holder in my truck, 
to buy it. And it's just kind of fun to be like, okay, well, it'd be, it'd be fun to have, you know, that kind of money and do whatever I want. Yes. Hold, hold on a second. Okay. Um, so, all right. You, so you can, you can bring that down, brother. All right. I can figure out how to do this. So we've been talking about volatility, right? Mm -hmm. So there's gotta be a way to measure volatility because there's a way to measure everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the way we measure volatility in stocks is a thing called beta. Okay. And so the, the benchmark for beta is the S and P 500. That's a beta of 1.0. So everything's measured off of that. So if something has a beta of 1.2, that means it's 20% more volatile than the S and P 500. Okay. That doesn't mean it'll make more money. It just means it's more volatile. Separate those two things in your mind guys. Okay. So if something has a, so if something has a beta less than one, say as 0.8 beta, now it's less volatile than the S&P 500. So okay. it's going to be kind of boring. Not guaranteed to make money. Okay. Doesn't mean it'll make less or more than the S&P 500. All we're talking about is volatility here. Okay. Um, you can also get into things that have negative beta. And that okay. means, now it means a positive beta means it'll still move in the same direction as the S&P 500, just with less volatility. A negative beta means it moves the opposite direction. Uh, small gold miners called junior gold miners. Some of them have negative beta because when the stock market starts crashing, people buy a lot of gold, right? All right. And small gold miners will get outsized returns because they're growing just like Bitcoin was early on. Oh, yeah. So many times they, when the, when the S and P the stock market starts crashing, those junior gold miners will go through the roof. And that's another one where right now, um, you know, in my, as they say in the, in the industry, in my personal account, um, I've, I've bought a couple of little junior gold miners through oh, a wow. small amount of money to each one and just see what happens. If the world, if the world, keeps going, well, then the rest of my investments are going to do awesome. If things start falling apart, then these guys are going to do awesome. And they're going to cushion that for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Diversify. So that's, that's my, that's my strategy. Okay. Again, just a guy with salon quality hair and a dream. Okay. <laughs> Not financial advice. <laughs> that's right. Okay? So um, the other one that has um, negative beta are inverse ETFs. Are you familiar with ETFs, Rich? Le electronic fund transfers or no? Uh, nope. <laughs> nope. Exchange traded funds. There um, we go. Okay. All right. So an exchange traded fund is in very general terms here, uh, a mutual fund, but it trades like a stock. So you can buy and sell it all day long versus just at the close, like mutual funds. Okay. And there you can find an ETF for anything. There's ETFs for sugar cane. There's ETFs for cocoa. There's ETFs for Europe. There's ETFs for, Indonesia, you name it. Okay. Wow. There's also inverse ETFs where they short a particular thing and then they'll do it with leverage, which is a great way to lose a lot of money if you're wrong. So there's a inverse ETF. But it's a disproportionate loss, isn't it? Well, it, it is. Yes. So yeah. if there's an ETF out there that triple shorts the S&P 500, Mm -hmm. So if the S&P 500 goes down by 10%, this particular ETF will go up by 30%. That's a, now, a, a good. Yeah, but isn't that kind of what uh, Nassim Taleb, the Black Swan, author of the Black Swan, isn't that kind of what his his fund does? They, I'm not real massive. familiar with his, they're, they're, I'm not real familiar with what his fund does. Um, I know a lot of those guys, um, the the perennial bears, you know, the world's always falling apart. Him and, uh, you know, um, Gerald Salente and uh, uh, Harry Dent. I mean, the world's always falling apart for those guys. Um, so they, they do a lot of shorting. Um, and if you want, we can get into a, a basic discussion of what shorting is, because that's about all I know about shorting stuff is is the basics of it. Um, and it's... Uh, well, can, I think if I understand it, and you mm -hmm. can walk me on target, but just real quick, let's say that I shorted the, you know, a, a month before September 11, 2001, I mm -hmm. shorted every, every uh, airline carrier. 
Mm -hmm. And then September 11 happens and the, the bottom falls out of the airline industry and this, and, and then I'm, I make a lot of money. Is that something like that? Yeah. Shorting is uh, first is incredibly high risk guys. I, I don't play around with shorting stocks. Okay. I will buy ETFs to short things because it limits my risk because I can only lose whatever I put into that ETF. But if you, uh -huh. if you short something, which I'll describe here in a moment, Rich, uh, your loss is technically infinity. Your potential loss is potentially infinity. So uh -huh. in very simple terms, what uh, shorting something is, is you borrow it, you sell it with the hope of later repurchasing it at a later date for a lower price. Hmm. Okay. So I like to use a, a cell phone example. So I got a cell phone here, right? Uh -huh. Let's say you have a cell phone as well, Rich. Let's say you have an iPhone uh, 11. Okay. okay. And I know, I, I know the iPhone 12 is coming out. Therefore your iPhone 11 is going to go down in value. Right. Uh -huh. So I go, Hey, and I know you're not using it. So I go, Hey, Rich, can I borrow that iPhone 11? And you say, of course, Will, you can borrow my iPhone 11. And I go out and sell your iPhone 11 for 200 bucks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's market value at that time. Now, at that point, I don't owe you $200. I owe you an iPhone 11, right? Mm -hmm. So now the iPhone 12 comes out. And suddenly the iPhone 11, your old phone, is worth 50 bucks. So I go back on eBay and buy an iPhone 11 for $50 and hand you your iPhone 11 back. Or a iPhone 11 is all I owe you is a iPhone 11. Mm -hmm. now, I just made 150 bucks. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the problem is, let's say the iPhone 12 uh, delivery gets delayed because of supply chain issues. It's going to be out a year, and all of a sudden, used phone prices go through the roof, and now it's worth 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. I still owe you an iPhone 11. Yeah. I only have 200 dollars in my hand from the sale though. So I have to come up with the other 300 because Rich needs his phone back now. Yeah. See what I'm saying, guys? So yeah. you're, we'll say it went to $1,000. We'll say it went to $2,000, something ridiculous. This yeah. is what happened with GameStop. Yeah. When, when it went through the roof, there was literally more people shorting the stock. There were more shares shorted of GameStop than there were shares in circulation. Wow. So when it started going up, people got margin called. And they had to, because you've borrowed the stock from the brokerage. So it's a loan and it's gone down typically 10 or 20% changes where they go, Hey, you, you got to cover this. So then they had to buy it and they get into a short squeeze where they have to buy it no matter the price. <laughs> so now there's a ton of demand and the price skyrockets. And that's how GameStop goes from 14 to 400. Hmm. And some people lost, lost oh. big. Yep. And the other people who bought GameStop went because a lot of a lot of people on Reddit, of all things, um, a lot of people on Reddit realized that it was shorted, you know, more shares. There were more shares shorted than there were in existence. So they knew there was going to be a short squeeze at some point. So they started buying. That drove the price up. That caused the short squeeze to happen. And it became the self-licking ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. So it was a bunch of Reddit people that caused that. Yeah. And they're going to do it again. Yep. Oh, yeah. They'll do it again at some point. Um uh, the one thing I'll throw out there is the government jumped in and said uh, that's why they stopped trading on it. It was to bail out the hedge funds because hedge funds were huge short on GameStop and they just got their, they got their faces ripped off. Yeah. But um, again, it's like that right there just, it, it bothers me. This is capitalism guys. You, you take a risk, you deserve, mm -hmm. yep. deserve what happens. Absolutely. Stupid no should stupid. hurt, right? Yeah. Stupid should hurt. It has to hurt. Yep. So let's, let's look at some examples of, of beta. We've all heard of Tesla stock, right? We know what that's done, right, Rich? Oh, yeah. That has a beta of 1.98. So it's basically twice as volatile as the S&P 500. But it sure has returns a whole lot better than the S&P 500, too. Now, again, two separate things. Something can have a high beta and really lousy returns. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also depends when you buy and sell. Do you hold long term? There's all these, all these variables with it. Uh, Procter & Gamble, right? consumer yep. staple type products, stuff we're going to buy every month, no matter how the, bad the economy is, we got to figure out a way to buy toothpaste, toilet paper, you know, razors, you name it. Well, maybe mm -hmm. not so much for you, but for me, I got to, you know, I got to buy razors, right? The boyish good looks. Yeah. The um, the, so Procter & Gamble has a beta of 0.45. Wow. And, and Tony down there asked, will the government bail me out if I lose in the stock market? No, they will not. Not a chance. Nope. You're, we are not too big to fail, brother, and that's the problem.
Yeah. Um, so, um, so the way I like to look at portfolio construction, Rich, is I like to, it's called beta adjusting the portfolio. Mm. So, so the more volatile something is, the less of it I own. Because I like Calmly. sleeping at night. I so like I, I like right now, things are pretty uncertain out there. I own some consumer staples, some Procter & Gamble type stuff. Um, cause it lets, it kicks out a dividend, lets me sleep at night and isn't jumping all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I have larger, no matter whether it's good times or bad, low beta stuff will always be a bigger part of my portfolio than high beta stuff. High but beta isn't beta. that a, a function of, of, of our age? You know, we're both in our fifties. Absolutely. And things yeah. That that's nature. a, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my, my oldest is, is 19 and he's putting money away in his 401k and his IRA. And it's like, just chuck it all into, you know, he's got 50 years, not yeah. quite 50 years till he retires. So kind of who, who, for him, who cares what happens in the next year or two, as long as we survive as a country, he's going to be just fine. Exactly. So yeah, that's the other thing guys. Look at how close you are to retirement because look at the people who thought they were doing awesome right before say the pandemic. And they were right, right on the cusp of retirement. All of a sudden, oh no, I had too much tech stock. I, I really had too much of anything because everything cratered then, right? So well, the same we saw it happen in the '90s, man, with the, yeah. the dot com bubble when it exploded. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, some that that's risk and beta in a nutshell. Okay, like a um, back of the back of the envelope type stuff there. Okay. Uh -huh. Um. And Alan brings up, yeah, you get, get in your mid sixties, you got to be really conservative. Yeah. At that point is, you know, especially once a person's retired, it's more about return of capital versus return on capital. That's exactly right. You know, and you know, it's, it's just a, a factor of that's the way the game is played. But you know, the, one of the reasons for doing the show is, is inflation, you know, mm -hmm. wh where's inflation taking us? I mean, it, you've done a great job of, over the past several, I don't know, heck, well, probably a month or so of talking about how we got to where we got. So wh what are we going to do if inflation really does take off? Man? Well, if it really takes off, we, we're we relatively smart guys, or at least we like to think we are, and so is everybody else listening here. But So we could figure this out, right? Mm -hmm. But it's going to take time. It's going to take pain because we're going to do some stupid stuff and stupid should hurt, right? Mm -hmm. So let's learn from some people who are in it now and have been going through it for quite some time. Um, and that's, it's Argentina. Those guys, I mean, the, they've been dealing with inflation since the nineties. It comes and goes right now. It's running 50% annually. <sighs> Think about that guys. That's not even hyperinflation. Yet. Hyperinflation is 50% a month. That's right. Okay. 50% annual inflation. That's, that's just, I mean, do that over two years, not even two years and your prices have doubled these of compounding, right? Well, and let's talk about this, you know, a healthy, what they say, they, mm -hmm. uh, the Fed, is healthy, 2 to 3% annual inflation. And with that, you will see prices double every 23 wow. years. You'll see mm -hmm. a doubling of prices on average. Yep. How would you like 50% annualized mm -hmm. inflation? That's insane, man. It is. It's crazy. It's, it's unmanageable um, by normal um ways the the way we would normally handle price increases is unmanageable and we're going to get into that right now brother okay. so the first thing i know you follow him what's ray dalio say about cash cash is trash cash is trash and it is all over the world right now it's really trashed in argentina because okay. 50 percent annually let's just break that down you know each month you're just losing what four or five percent ish four yeah. percent okay so as soon as you get it Spend it what, right now. What were we taught when we were kids, Rich? When you get money, you save, save it. it. When you get money in a high inflation environment, as soon as you get your money, you spend it. Exactly. I got to make it It's going to be worth less. Yeah. So get rid of it. You get get that purchasing power captured while you can. Yeah. Okay? Dr. Fuller says, I got to watch my government version of 401k explode upward under Trump. Now I get to watch inflation erode my purchasing power under Biden. Ain't life grand. Yep. And so there's, you know, there's, there's things that can be done inside of there. And we're going to get into that a little bit, TC. Um, and again, you know, risk reward, every person's different. Okay. Nope. So even right now in our environment, 
even if it was our normal environment, two to three percent inflation, which is their target, like you talked about, Rich, a savings mm-hmm. account, like we talked about, is guaranteed to lose purchasing power every year, right? Yes. Well, now imagine fifty percent annual inflation. Savings wow. accounts. I mean, you might as well just outlaw them because nobody in their right mind is going to have one. And why right? would you do that? Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's it's a guaranteed loss. It's guaranteed to hurt your family to have a savings account. Um, so as soon as they get their money, they spend it. Even more so, if they can get a loan on something, they take out the loan. Because as their wages increase, even if they don't keep up with 50% inflation, even if their wages are going up 40% a year, Mm -hmm. a 10% loan on, say, a car, or 20% loan, 30% interest rate on a loan is cheap. Yes. And inflation pays off the vehicle for you, pays off the asset for you. So here's... I, I was having this it's such a strange way of thinking. I, I don't mean to interrupt yeah. you, but I mean, yeah, it, it flies in the face of everything we think we know. Mm-hmm. If you want to go in debt, absolutely. It's the yeah. best financial decision you can make. Yep. If you're taking out a 10% loan to buy that new Mercedes, hell, you might as well because it's going to pay yeah. for itself. You're welcome. Absolutely. Right? So here's something to think about. So I, I bought a, a, a little tractor a couple years back and I got a mm-hmm. 0%. I bought it brand new and I got a 0% loan from the manufacturer. Was that a smart move for me, Rich? It's okay. If you want to call me stupid, it's okay. <laughs> I would never do that. Okay. Well, it's 0% interest, right? So it's free money. So I, I had the money idea. saved up for it, right? Mm-hmm. So I set up auto pay out of a separate savings account, put the money in there, and now it just makes that payment out of there every month. It's 0% interest. So... Mm-hmm. In the end, at the end of the five-year period, I'm going to pay the exact same for the tractor. It's not going to make much in the savings account, but if an emergency comes up, I have the cash on hand, right? Uh-huh. Okay. At that point, inflation was running eh, 2%, 3%. Let's just say 3%, okay? So at that point, I'm may, if, I, if I went in, especially if I went and invested that money, my money could have made enough money to pay off the tractor, right? Yeah. Okay. So now let's, let's change that around. Let's say inflate or interest running five percent i'm paying five percent interest now but right now today we have an eight percent inflation that's the same three percent spread isn't it yeah so yeah it's it's just such a backwards way of thinking but this is also what unsound money does it flies in the face debtors get rewarded and savers get crushed that's exactly right yeah, uh, who, I, I forget who the economist was that said that hyperinflation is wealth redistribution, mm-hmm. and and that's yep. that's that takes a second to to wrap your mind around. But hyperinflation yep. is wealth redistribution. Yep. So uh, the other things they're doing down there uh, to store value, they're obviously mm-hmm. not using savings account. They're not using physical cash, uh, precious metals, mm-hmm. you know, gold, silver, even jewelry. Even though you you, you got to pay somebody's profit margin and cost to turn it into jewelry, because inflation is so high, you're better off holding that jewelry as value than holding cash. Hmm. So it's 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 crazy times down there. Um, food, if you can buy food out ahead, it's just going to be more expensive next week, next month. And they're they're even uh, storing storing um, value in medicines. So. There's some really good documentaries about Venezuela. If you can find them on YouTube, there's uh, like they can't even afford potatoes. So uh, this guy went into a Burger King and he's like, you're the first customer we've had in like six weeks or something insane. Like, really? What? And uh, they're, they're, it looks like French fries, but they're actually made out of some other plant down there. I mean, it it is you, you need to watch it because it just shows you what may be coming. Yeah. Uh, here in the good old US of A because uh, we can't print money forever, folks. That's it. Hey, TC brings up it's time to buy that Rolex Submariner he'd been looking at for the last two decades. If them. you can justify that to your bride, brother, you let me know how you did that, okay? Yeah, I can't, you can't find them, I'm telling you right now. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, so let's see here, what else we got? Um, let, let's talk a little bit about um, how to protect ourselves there in that high inflation environment like Argentina is doing. So let's, let's think about some things that go up during that period of time. Rents. Rents are going crazy in the U.S. right now. Part of that supply and demand with housing. Uh, part of that's inflation. Uh-huh. So 
if you can, you know, if you can be on the landlord side of that, when that's happening, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So if, if somebody's inclined to do that, I'm looking at it personally, I'll throw that out there. Um, the other one is invest in things that have, you know, pricing power, you know, again, go back. To, I, I like consumer staples right now. Um, because they, they have pricing power. People are going to buy them. You, you're not going to see these huge returns, but I'm going to see a return on my capital. It's not going to be big, um, but those, you know, Procter & Gamble just sits there and churns out money. Uh-huh. Okay. Day um, after day, year after day, year. Day after, day, month after month, just boring. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like I, I tell my kids, when you find something that works, do it with monotonous regularity. That's um, right. So, so debt. Dead again, this, this flies in the face of everything we were taught, brother. Um, but both sides of it. So if someone has a lot of debt right now and therefore doesn't have a lot of discretionary income, inflation is going to squeeze that, that discretionary income to the point that you can't maintain that lifestyle anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if a person is in a high debt situation, now high debt isn't a certain dollar amount. It's in compared to what your income is. Yes, yeah, relative. Yeah, exactly. So if a person is in that high relative debt situation, I'd really encourage you get that paid down, get that cushion built back out, get more discretionary income. You can, you know, pick up a side gig, whatever you got to do, get that paid down. Now, yeah. conversely, if a person has a lot of discretionary income, you might want to look at taking on debt. That's right. That's Which again, crazy. It sounds crazy. It does. It does sound crazy. It sounds absolutely nuts. I, I every time I say it, I, I I've looked at the numbers. I know it works. Okay. And uh, David, there you just brought it up. Uh, food prepping. We're about ready to touch on that a little bit, and yeah. I think we're we may dig into that a little deeper here in the near future as well. Um, yeah. And Alan brings up a point: debt to income ratio influences loans. You bet it does. Absolutely. Yeah. They want to make sure you can service that debt. Um, mm-hmm. So. You know, if a person has a lot of discretionary income, look at using debt as a tool. Now, we've all been taught debt is bad, and that's because human nature tends to overcook things. Um, well, can we talk about that? It, yeah, it, yeah, let's do that. Just, just from a philosophical perspective, I mean, this it's I love that we're going down this road, you know. Debt's bad, and that's, that's kind of the way, you know, you should be raising your kids. But not so much because debt is a tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, much like a, a, a firearm's bad, a handgun is bad. It's scary. No, it's not. It's a tool. Mm-hmm. If you know how to use these things, they're tools. And a lot of this yep. stuff we're talking about, it's a simple math problem, which yep. is why we were, you know, back in late January, early February of 2020, we were ringing the alarm bells on the mm-hmm. COVID situation because it came down to this is a math problem, guys. Yep. Um, the same thing we're looking at here with with where the economy is going. It, and to some degree, and I know that economics really isn't mathematics. It's it's psychology with a little bit of math sprinkled in. For sure. But at the same time, listen to what we'll say. And again, we're not financial planners. Please don't mistake this. But we're talking about what we are doing and the mm-hmm. way we view things. And uh, hopefully you find some of this entertaining and uh, informative. Sorry, and, Will. Yeah, no, it's all good, brother. And really what I want to do is get people to think outside the box. Yeah. Because when it, when inflation takes off the way you and I believe it's going to, Rich, the people who are not thinking outside of the current paradigm box have a hurt. savings account, you know, so on and so forth. The I hate to say it, those are the people that are going to get crushed. Yeah. And I, I don't want to see anybody get crushed, especially anybody in, in, in this group. You know, I mean, this is, if we can make the financial pain less for everybody through just thinking through what's best for you, you know, then you've got free, free time, free mental assets to better take care of your family in every other way. Yeah. So, um, all right. You were saying so, use that as a tool, Will, I'm sorry. Yeah, use, use it, use it as a tool. You know, mm-hmm. um, I've never, like I've said before, calculators never lied to me, you know, um, so you use it as a tool and know your risk tolerance tolerance. If, if a person's younger, you know, they probably have, they have more time to recover any potential loss, but that doesn't mean they're a high risk tolerance person either. You know, maybe they're more conservative in nature and don't like that risk. That's cool. You, 
I'll say it over and over again. Anytime I talk to any of this stuff, what lets you sleep at night? That's mm-hmm. what you should Because who cares how much money you make if, if you can't sleep at night? Exactly. Yeah. It, it's that's not, it's the not point. worth it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we touched on a side gig a little bit ago. So a way that I would be preparing for inflation right now would be pick up a side gig or work some overtime whatever, bring in a little extra money now, maybe buy some junk silver with that. Mm -hmm. Maybe buy a little extra food with that. Take that money you make now and turn it into something that will protect your purchasing power in the future. Mm -hmm. So, you know, along with that, uh, if it's a side gig and it's something, you know, you might think maybe you do more of, I, I encourage you to try to find something that's scalable. Yeah. You know, if, if you, if you drive for one of these ride service companies, there's only one of you, 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 you the only way to do is do more hours. And there's only so many hours in a day. Right. So try to find something that's maybe scalable that you can, you know, build and make bigger. Uh, if, if that becomes a possibility. And that, um, that, that a lot of people don't recognize it. And Dr. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this, like why, you know, women are more into healthcare field. Healthcare is, not very scalable because there's only one of you and you can only have two, three, four patients. Whereas if I create a course uh, on, well, you know, whatever mm-hmm. and put it out there on Udemy and then a hundred thousand people buy the course, yep. that's unlimited scalability. So right. listen to what we'll say. And it yep. favors those with uh, that have a lot of uh, uh, the, the classic cases, you know, you write a book. I, I do the, I do the work one time or I mm-hmm. write a piece of music. I do it one time and then I put it out there uh, on Amazon and then I make money on it for eternity. Yep. Um, and you know, do- Dr. Gordon Bodson says rental property is scalable. Yes, it, it can is. be. Yep. Yeah. And Ted brings up a good point. The, F- the fed is the wild card in this because they can't fight inflation like in the eighties, because if they raise interest rates, they're going to get crushed That's under exactly the national right. debt. We can't, we can't, we're talking about that disposable income. Can you service the debt, right? Right. The U S government cannot service the debt with a higher inflation rate. That's right. And, that, and that's why I, I, I think it's all talk that they're going to raise interest rates. I think it's talk to try and calm the markets down about inflation. That's my own personal view. I could be way wrong too. What do I know? We could. And uh, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, we, we're, there's a rabbit hole there, I think. I'm telling you, um, yeah. So um, a couple of things. Um, on the, the rental side of things. Okay. Yes. If a person's renting, if I was renting right now, I'd be going to my landlord going, Hey, how about a long-term lease? Let's lock that in now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, of course the downside there is if it turns on you, you can get trapped out there. So there's a risk involved with everything. Um, so you, you gotta, you know, look at it. Are you going to be there long-term? What do you think the chances are in your market of that, um, that rental market turning, turning the other way on you. I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Arthur Guinness uh, the, at the Guinness Bury there. I think it's St. James gate or wherever it is in Dublin. I've been there a couple of years ago. He locked in like a 7,000 year lease mm-hmm. or something like that. Yep. Yep. So, Hey, it, you know, but again, it looks brilliant now, but it could have looked really stupid too. It could have, you yeah. know, I mean, if it, if it gone the other way on him, you know, Guinness would cease to exist or have been sold off. And so there, there's risk involved in everything. It paid off for him. Awesome. It can, it can roll the other way too. Um, yeah. Yep. So Gordon brings up that great point there. So yeah, that's exactly right. It takes more expensive to fix up these houses. Yeah. Yep. And that's where there's another thing, you know, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Um, I'm, uh, p- setting aside m- extra money for my car insurance premiums because mm. I think car insurance is going to go way up. Auto parts are way up. Used cars are way up. So if somebody totals a car and they have to buy another one of a 2018 fill in the blank car. That insurance company is going to shell out more money. They're going to get that money from me and you brother. No. So I think we're going to see insurances go up. I mean, imagine if God forbid somebody's house burns down, it's going to be more expensive to replace, right? Yes, that's exactly right. They're that's gonna get point. that money from us. Yeah. All insurance companies do is filter money. So mm-hmm. that money's gonna come from us. Um, now on the flip side of that, if I was a landlord right now, I'd want everybody on a month to month lease. Oh yeah. 
because it just keeps going up and up and up. And whenever I feel in my market that that's going to top, okay, I'm starting to, it's starting to feel toppy. You know, I'm starting to see some rents come down. Now I'd be like, Hey, because now by then those people are going to be panicked. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey, how do you feel about locking in a two year lease at this rate? So again, that's timing the market, right? So there's risk involved there. But if you bought the rental property, right. And then let that happen. You might miss out on a little gain here or there. It might even take a dip and then go back up some more. But if, if it was purchased right and maintained well, you, I think that would be survivable. True. Again, what do I know? I'm Thanks. a dumb throttle jockey. Okay. <laughs> All right. With so, salon quality hair. Um, don't forget that. That's right. Um, so let's talk about hard assets here. Some of our favorite stuff here, Rich. Okay. Yeah. Precious metals. Okay. And yes, brass and lead count. Yes, they do. Let's, I mean, realistically, I mean, it, I can remember uh, looking on line and finding jacketed hollow points, nine mil for a dollar around at the peak. And you could well, go on, they... you could go online at a, at, you know, a place where people buy and sell ammo, you know, personally, the, the eBay of that stuff. And they were, they were getting 75, 80 cents around for that stuff that before everything went crazy was what, 35 cents around. Yeah. And so matches across the country had to cancel. Uh, I know Seeklander was having a problem, you know, and as was all the, the major firearms trainers with people having to, mm -hmm. to cancel because they couldn't get access to ammunition. And, yep. and, and there for a while, you know, the reloaders were laughing at everybody. Ah, we got this figured out. Mm -hmm. And then they quickly started running out of their supplies and couldn't get yep. primer and powder. So yep. the time and to buy it is now. Precious absolutely. Metal. And guys, you know, we're going to talk about hard assets here, but let me talk about a, a soft asset that I, I was fortunate on when it came to ammo, and that's just pure dumb luck. And sometimes mm -hmm. you just get lucky. Mm -hmm. my, both of my boys started shooting competition with me uh, just before everything went crazy on ammo. And just out of pure dumb luck, I purchased two years worth of reloading components right before everything went crazy. No. So just pure dumb luck. Sometimes you just get lucky. Uh, but don't... I didn't think I was smart because of that though. I knew it was luck. <laughs> so <laughs> if we get lucky, let's, let's keep our egos in check and make sure we don't start thinking we're smart. Mm -hmm. True. Okay. So, um, is that, that'll, that'll bite you too. Um, so, um, again, precious metals in the house, that small fireproof safe. Okay. Uh, gold advantage of gold is you can, store a lot of value in a very small physical space. Mm -hmm. Gold's uh, what, 1800-ish an ounce right now. Right. So, you know, five ounces of gold isn't going to take up a lot of space. That's $10,000 ish. Okay. Problem with it is it's not very divisible. So let's say we end up in an Argentina type situation. And I take my, you know, even a 10th of an ounce gold coin that's worth $180 right now and I, but all I need is a loaf of bread and some hamburger meat. Well, mm -hmm. that's not going to work out well. Right. So it, it's a, everything's a give and take. Um, and it, it for sure is there. So well, and that's why you saw back in the day, those, those old gold coins, uh, you know, they had a cross in the center. It wasn't necessarily the Christian cross. It was so that the, the thing could be cut into pieces mm -hmm. and, and some gold, you can buy it by a sheet that you can cut down into these little, Mm -hmm. small pieces so I don't, you know, one of the disadvantages okay no go ahead oh i was just gonna say it's been years since i saw it but at one point somebody was making a gold it was the same size as a credit card and about that thick and it was mm -hmm. almost like perforated and you could yeah. tear off one little piece and it was whatever it was a hundredth of an ounce or whatever i don't know what the denomination was yeah they, um, they still make those yeah do they okay yeah, and so you can get around some of that, but the other thing with, I think, a disadvantage is the premiums that you pay to purchase mm -hmm. those precious metals. And then purchasing the precious metals, do you want it sitting in a vault in a Cayman's will, or do you want it something that you have at your home or in a safe somewhere? In my, if This is my way of thinking, guys. If I, if I can't lay my hands on it, I don't really own it. I agree. Yeah, it's just, it, how do I get to the Cayman's if the world falls apart? You don't. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to go there now. It's cold outside. Um, but it, it, if I can't put my hands on it, I don't really own it. 
I agree. Okay. Um, so let's talk about silver. Um, more divisible, especially if you buy buy junk silver. Uh, because you can get, you know, a, a 90% silver nickel is about two and a half dollars right now. Uh-huh. That should tell us something right there. Just I, I, that's what I was going to say. You know, you, you have on your notes here about a quarter, Will, and a, mm-hmm. a, a 1964 quarter or earlier is worth what, about six bucks or, or more? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Six dollars. And, and, and here's the thing, you know, we, we've talked before about during the fall of Rome, how they debased their currency from 90% silver down to 10% or less. We're doing the same thing here. A lot of people don't realize when Will says junk silver, we're talking about constitutional silver, right. a, a quarter from pre-1964 64 and earlier contained 90% silver. And then from 65 to 70, it had 40%. And I think after 70, it had nothing. Correct. Yep. Uh, and, it, and it's called junk because it doesn't have any collectible value because these were circulated coins. So there's no collectible value. Hence, that's why they're called junk. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's not so much junk now, is it, Will? No, it sure isn't. But what I, one thing I really like about junk silver is that nickel will never be worth less than a nickel. That's right. Because I can always just go spend it. Mm-hmm. And you know what, Rich? I would be thrilled to go spend that for a nickel. I would be thrilled to lose that investment. Yeah. Because that means everything it means we have sound money again. Can you imagine what this country would look like again if that happened? There's gonna be some serious pain in between for sure. And I don't want that. But everything else would be right and just in the world again. Mm-hmm. So and I don't I mean, I I I think you agree with me. I don't think we're going that way, but at least it does give you a bottom. You know, if if you go by whatever fill in the stock the piece of land the whatever there's always a chance it goes to zero yeah well that, what kills me about quarter is always gonna be a quarter a quarter is always going to be a quarter it's, it's one of those things where they would tell you you know you don't precious metals who who does that but again it's like well then why did you get away from it if it's so mm-hmm. worthless keep printing yeah. it and keep keep uh, minting them in silver yeah well, no i mean but it's it's a dumb investment okay is yeah. it really well, you know, but again, it's, it's that how much, I mean, if, uh, I remember it wasn't, what was it after 08, 09 ish, tell say 2010, very much ish silver mm-hmm. hit what 50, 52 an ounce. Exactly. Now right somebody now, took their entire worth and bought silver at that point. I'd be like, no, that's not smart. No, because now it's what hovering around 22, 20, yeah, somewhere in that range, 22, yeah. 24, you know, yeah. so you get, you know, little bits and pieces guys, yeah. you know, do a little of this, a little of that. You know, a little, a little silver, a little gold, a little food, or even a little bit in the savings account. So you can take advantage of something uh, at this inflation rate. If the inflation rate becomes Argentina, I would have zero. My savings account might as well close it. I'll have nothing in that. Exactly. Now there are disadvantages to, to silver and other precious yep. metals. Will what are some of them? It is. This was I teased this earlier, brother. This is a highly manipulated market. Okay, it's not as manipulated as crypto, which is very highly manipulated, um, but uh, silver is highly manipulated. It's an industrial metal. That's its main use in the real world right now. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's people with an incentive to keep that price down. Okay. Yeah. And I'm uh, let's look at uh, Jay's. Uh, and of course, that's okay. not his real name. <laughs> Prior to COVID, one could get free shipping for precious metal ordered over a hundred dollars or more. Most of the major online retailers are making you purchase two hundred to two hundred fifty before you can get the free shipping, and most are very limited on the availability of junk silver now. Yep. I, I haven't purchased junk silver in quite a while. And in doing research for this, I went online and looked at the prices of junk silver. And I, it was it was almost the big one. I was like, holy cow. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can name that TV show, I'll be seriously impressed. Sanford and Son, man. Oh, there you go, brother. It's the big one, Elizabeth. I'm uh, coming home, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Goldman Sachs was manipulating the silver market. No it's way. Not, yeah, shocking, right? Now that's not some some um um that, that's not some conspiracy theory. Uh there's a article in the the links I sent you there, brother. Um they paid nine hundred and twenty million dollars to settle a case regarding manipulation of the silver market and the treasury bill market. Treasury bills, US treasuries, they were manipulating that market. I, t- I tell you, man, it's 
Well, that's what a lot of people, if you if you do any research, they're like, there are a lot of uh, people out there holding down precious metals, and when they mm -hmm. pop, it's going to go hard. But like yep. Ted says, there's no dividends on gold or silver. It's just inflationary insurance. Yep. And I, he's sure. not wrong. No, yeah, he's he's right. You know, um, you know, and and that's a great way to to look at it right there. It's it's. I would love to lose a ton of money on my precious metals. Yeah. I would be thrilled beyond words. Because that means everything else is doing really well in our country. Yeah. So so we know for a fact that Goldman Sachs and potentially others have been, mm -hmm. you know, su suppressing and manipulating the silver and treasuries market. God knows how many other people are doing it. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm sure $920 million fine is, is just a slap in the wrist for those yep. folks. Well, the Speak. real question is how much did they make manipulating it? Because <sighs> if they made... I'm just going to make up a number. They made $10 billion manipulating it. So they, they shelled out about a billion dollars. Oh, okay. That's a pretty good return. Still, getting, still, still a great return. Exactly. So did it really disincentivize them not to do it in the future? Probably not. Uh, let's, uh, you know, we had a, we did a show on how to win a fight in prison. And one of the, one of my prison stories is um, I was working in the medical pod one day because so somebody could go get chow. And I'm talking to this really intelligent criminal and he's got himself put in the medical pod because he's a, a squirrely little accountant. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, he was telling me about this money scheme he came up, came up with. And it, it, he made $500,000 in less than a year uh, scamming people. And I said, wow, you know, that is that really worth it? And he literally leaned back in his chair with his orange jumpsuit on. He's like, Officer Brown, how much money do you make this year? And I'm like, oh. He's like, well, I made 500000 and all I have to do is sit in here for a year, play basketball and hang out, and then I'm going to walk out and get that money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he goes like, yeah, that was a good investment for me. Yeah, and really, I mean, put put aside the moral and ethical side of that, okay? He's not wrong. <laughs> He's not wrong. If, if, if at the end of that two-year period, he made two fifty a year, right? And he's not going to pay taxes on it. And this was in the nineties, man. I mean, right. That was, that's so, and this is the, this is the, the, the problem is, you know, you know, the, the, you know, sheep, wolves and sheep dogs, right? Yeah. Well, the wolves aren't just the guy at the gas station looking to rob you. That guy's a wolf too. Yeah, you know, exactly. And it, it, here again, it goes back to moral hazard. Mm -hmm. You lock, you, you lock up people like that. Instead of Goldman Sachs getting a $920 million slap on the wrist, you, you take uh, some executive off, off in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. And it creates a moral hazard where they won't do that. But as long as they can make ten billion and pay mm -hmm. nine hundred twenty million, it's always going to be a good yep. investment, right? And they, they, I believe that one. I could be wrong. Read the article, guys. But I believe they admitted no wrongdoing and blah blah blah. And yeah, yeah. So you know, as usual, you know, the the, the biggest criminals usually wear suits. <laughs> sure. Um. So let's let's get into stocks, bonds, and securities a little bit here, okay? Right. Talk to a financial advisor. This is where I sigh. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Listen, a lot of them are good people, okay? But in my opinion, I've run across way too many that are just salesmen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, they they talk they talk a line from corporate, you know. Buy, 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 buy every dip, so blah, 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 you know, cookie cutter portfolios. The same one works for everybody. I, I, I have a financial advisor now. He's not like that. I interviewed a bunch. Uh, I fired more than a few. Um, so really sit down and interview him, really talk to him, you know, ask him some stuff. You know, how, how do you decide how big to make each position in my portfolio? Do they talk about beta or do they just go, well, this, this one's been back tested for the last 40 years. Mm. Well, okay. So it's been back tested. That doesn't tell me anything about the future. Exactly. Right? And of course, none of us can know the future in fairness. Right. But you know, what are they, what are they really touting? If it sounds to me, if it sounds like a corporate line, thanks for your time. Have a nice day. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and let's face it, they haven't been wrong. Um, you know, if you look back since really the dot com bubble, they've been right. Use mm -hmm. any portfolio you can pick and it'll go up over time. But that's because the dollar has been de devaluing since well before that. Exactly. So what you really are is short the dollar. 
<laughs> right? But cash is trash. Exactly. So, it, it, you know, it's it's that it's that self-licking ice cream cone because it just keeps being true until the day it isn't, right? So mm-hmm. be ready for that day. Unfortunately, in the meantime, if you want to maintain purchasing power, you, you we have to participate. We do. And uh, Mike says, you know, you, you're going to need one, but they're generally just highly licensed salespeople. It's true. Yep. So um, the, what I like to do is ask them, what did the, you know, what'd you do prior to, what'd you have your clients do prior to say the pandemic sell off or prior uh-huh. to the housing crisis? What'd you have your clients do? And by the way, go ahead and print that off for me. Take the, take the client's name off. That's none of my business. Take the dollar amounts off. That's none of my business. Show me. Uh-huh. And if they him and haw, and oh, you know, I can't go back that far in my records. Yeah, I, I call I call bovine excrement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and also look very carefully at what they if, if someone comes to you with an investment idea, look at the time frame. Okay. In 2015, I was approached about investing in a REIT, R-E-I-T, real estate investment trust. You mm-hmm. can invest in it inside your huh? your uh, tax advantaged accounts in many cases. Okay. And they were like, yeah, we've been making X percent per year. I forget what it was, astronomical numbers. So I asked, oh, wow, that's, it sounded pretty good. And finally it dawned on me. I said, when did you guys start? I said 2009. <laughs> so they bought everything at the bottom. Exactly. A monkey could have bought the right properties at the bottom. <laughs> Show me how you can manage through hard times. I don't care about, I mean, it would have been like buying stocks in you know the summer of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody could have made money after that. It would have taken some guts, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so really look at time frames as well because they 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 will make the time frame just what it takes to, to make it look good. Yeah. So, so again, also, read, read the book Lying with Statistics, folks. Yeah. Uh, and also, like if you go on uh pick your website, Yahoo, Google, whatever, and you search back and there's there's set times you go back, you know, you can do a chart for a stock, five years, 10 years. Mm-hmm. Look at what happened in those years in the world before you go, yeah, this is a great mutual fund ETF. Look, look at think about what happened in the world during that time. Mm-hmm. So and you know, put that against your risk tolerance, your age, your overall situation. Okay. Uh the next one, uh that's for all the deeper I'm going to go on stocks and stuff. Okay. Good. Um, next one is because this one comes up uh, certificates of deposit CDs and people go, well, CDs paid 12% in 1979. That's awesome. Well, not necessarily. No, what was infl- what exactly. Was what was inflation? That was yeah. like, what, 19% or something. Right. But number. nobody ever thinks about that. They think yeah. about the, well, I paid this much interest. Well, so, so you know, you're guaranteeing a loss, right? Yeah. Um, Let's lock in that loss for you today, sir. Sign exactly. right here. Now, there is a game that can be played there, okay? And this is one I will probably try to play a little bit, okay, when the time comes. Mm-hmm. And that is if you can lock in a long-term CD as inflation and therefore interest rates are peaking, if you can lock that in then, inflation and interest rates go down, but you've locked in that 12 14% CD, and everything else starts coming down. Now all of a sudden you're going to get some outsized returns, right? Yes. Yes. Again, I do that with a small dollar amount. because There's a chance I'm going to lose purchasing power. And some people did that in the late seventies, right? Yep. For sure. Yep. I'm, I'm related to a couple of them. That's where I got the idea. <laughs> uh, not, again, not that smart. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the, um, it's also a way a CD like that is a, is a way to keep some, some dry powder available. Um, if, if it's a shorter term CD, it'll come up in three months, six months. You can use that as collateral for a loan if there's a good opportunity that comes up. Um, and then when that CD matures, it just pays off the loan for you. Yeah. So even though you're losing purchasing power with it, 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 if it's a portion of your liquid savings you want to have on hand and that's worth the risk to you, it's something to consider. Okay. Okay. Um, so now let's, let's talk about... What do we do if we right now? What what should a, what could a person do if they have a big old savings account right now? Because That's a great question. They're they're losing eight percent a year right now in purchasing power. What to do? Well, one possibility is just accept that loss because that makes them sleep at night. 
<laughs> if that lets them sleep at night, hey, and you a person can live with that eight percent loss, I'm all for it. You'll never catch me giving you a hard time about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's 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 one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum would be to completely empty it out and go buy silver or gold or fill in the blank. Well, uh asset, hard asset. An asset, hard asset of some sort. Yeah. Well, there's risks that come with that as well. So what I like to do is do a little bit of everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we touched on this previously, Rich. You know, if you take say I'm I'm gonna use percentages here. So let's say you take 20% of your savings account. And go buy food. Run down to Sam's, yeah. Costco, buy food. Didn't really lose anything there. You still have, you know, X number of dollars. It's just sitting in the pantry now instead of sitting in that savings account with ones and zeros. And again, like, like we've said, not not a, a couple of 55-gallon drums full of wheat that you may never eat, but, mm -hmm. but stuff that you're going to eat anyway, and the prices mm -hmm. are just continuing to rise. You know, that's right. perishable and non-perishable items, right? For sure. You know, so... It's still a savings. It's still part of your savings. You've just transferred it from ones and zeros where we've been conditioned to think about it as, as savings into something else. Calories, energy. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. What about, uh, it says, what about holding a significant amount in savings for a few months while you shop for land? Yeah, I. that's, again, that's a use. So you're, you're taking a, a potential reward, the land, and a known risk that you're going to lose some purchasing power. And even at 8% inflation, guys, over a few months, you're not going to lose that much purchasing power. Well, and again, 8% is, is not a real number. I mean, right, uh, for as, sure. As you said on, on a previous show some weeks ago, right? I mean, if you take mm -hmm. the metrics from the 80s, I think it's yep. like 14% or something yep. like that. Yep. Uh, and that was before the latest number came out too. I've, I, I need to look, my gut feel is that we are now in the highest inflation since the sixties. If we yeah. use the same metrics, the same stuff they use in the seventies and eighties, that's my gut feel right now. I, I, I wouldn't bet any money on that, but that's my gut feel. Yeah. Um, so that's the other thing guys is, you know, make informed choices. So if you're out shopping for land that you think is going to go up in value more than, that more than the rate of inflation. So you accept a couple of months, six months, even a year worth of loss on your purchasing power in that savings, but you're, you're making a conscious decision to, so you can take advantage of an opportunity. And that's the biggest thing I want you guys to think about is think about it that way. What's my risk? What's my reward? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then beta adjust all that. You don't just beta adjust your stock portfolio, beta adjust your savings account too. I guarantee the food I've gone and purchased, very low beta. It's yeah, same here. Right, we were getting uh, our lean ground beef for like three fifty a pound, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's in the freezer when ground beef is six, seven, eight dollars a pound. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so just just yep. exactly what you're saying, and we were yep. buying hundreds of pounds of it at a time. We're right. going to eat it. We got five people living on the farm. Right, for sure. So. Um, Silver is another thing you can do with some of your savings account. Um, and again, we, we, we touch on the junk silver. You can also buy silver bars. Um, and then gold. And then especially right now, gold inflation's high guys, but there's is something to be said for having some, some cash in your savings account right now. If inflation gets much higher, my savings account is going to get drawn down even more. Thaddeus asked the question, what is beta adjust? And, and we talked about that earlier in the show, but can you give Thaddeus just a quick rundown on that? Sure. Be, uh, Thaddeus, it's, it's basically your risk adjusting. So something that is higher risk is going to have a much smaller portion of your, your hard-earned capital put towards it. Something that's more stable, less risky, uh, less beta is going to have more of your, your money put in there. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's about all I got for this, Rich. I, I got a couple other things to add, though, if you if you don't mind. Um, no, please. So that kind of wraps up the show. I think yeah. what Will's going to do now is kind of talk to us about China and some other closing thoughts. So if you're interested yep. in that, please stick around. Uh, and we got more to come. Go ahead, sir. All right. So China. Um, so for years, China, even using billboards, has been encouraging their people to buy gold. Hmm. First question I always ask when something like that happens, why? <laughs> why? Are they, I mean, the, the Chinese are a lot of things, but they are not stupid. No. Okay. 
Um, and they're thinking a lot longer than this, the next quarter, you know, they're, they're not thinking about the next quarter. They're not thinking about the next election cycle. They're thinking about generations down the road. That's right? Exactly right. Um, now the renminbi um, has appreciated 12% against the dollar in about the last year, give or take. Mm. Okay. Now here's my question. We see the supply chain problems. We see what that's doing to inflation in our country, price inflation in our country. Are the Chinese manipulating the supply chain to drive up prices to create unrest in our country? How to do that? Come on, man. Well, I mean, the, the real answer is I don't know. But, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it could well be a duck. Mm -hmm. So, and they they will gain world global power the more unrest there is in the U.S. And for those of you that are maybe wondering the renovate is the official currency in China, am I correct mm -hmm. in that? You are correct. Yes, sorry. Okay. Um, so are they doing some fourth generation warfare stuff there? I don't know. Maybe seems like it would fit. Right. I'm gonna say, uh, yeah. So they, they're taking what they know has happened with our money printing. That's going to drive prices up. Now they can exa exacerbate that, make it worse and just enjoy the fruits of that investment as we have less power around the world because of it. Yeah. Um, uh, ah, Ted, 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 perfect Ted's segue. ahead of the game, man. I, I think, Ted, did you get a copy of the show notes? <laughs> Ted says, China, mm -hmm. says, for those of you that are listening and not reading his comment, Ted said, China seems to be encouraging food storage and doing it at the governmental level. Hard to trust sources. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a, tr I don't know how much I trust the source, but at least it's a U.S. based source. Mm -hmm. And that is the USDA. United States Department of Agriculture says by the middle of this year, the middle of 2022, China will hold 69% of the world's corn reserves. 69%. What's that going to do to food prices? I mean, corn is in everything, right? Everything. They're going to hold 60% of the world's rice reserves and 51% of the world's wheat reserves. That's according to the USDA, not the right question wing is conspiracy theory.com. But why okay? are they doing that? Why? Why, would, why are they investing that? That's a lot of money to invest in something that will eventually just rot. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a reason they're doing it. Is it to, if we look back in history, why did the Arab Spring start? Food was oh, expensive. It, exactly. That's it. Why did the, why did unrest happen in Mexico? I can't remember the year now. I apologize. It was because corn prices went through the roof after NAFTA. You know, can, can we talk just, just real quick on the Arab Spring? Yeah. yeah. I remember, I think that was under Hillary Clinton's State Department, and I remember them applauding like, oh, yeah, look at this. This is so great. This mm -hmm. Arab Spring, this uprising, mm -hmm. the people are finally taking back the reins of power. The guys, the blowback on that was tremendous. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was one of the most disruptive things and, and not in a good way. Yep. And uh, so, you know... <laughs> And they thought it was going to be a great thing. And then ultimately, you know, that's very debatable. But anyway. Uh, yeah. But so again, let people start starving, man. Let, let right. people miss nine meals and, and mm -hmm. watch all hell break loose. Yeah. I mean, we can look back at the protests in our country, you know, after the George Floyd thing in, in Minneapolis. And, and there was a lot of damage done. A lot of people hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much more those protests are going to be. Any protest. Okay. is going to be when they're hungry. How many how many well to do neighborhoods are people going to walk through? You know, that, so that ties back into our our core of self defense, right? So if if the grocery stores are are just chaotic because of these things happening, right? And you don't, but if you don't have to go to the grocery store, you know, the best defense is no be there, right, Daniel? Son, that's right. Don't be with. The best place to defend is somewhere not getting attacked. So there you exactly. go. Um, exactly. Uh, Jason asks, uh, 72 hours away from apocalypse at any given time, right? Yeah. yeah. Nine meals, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, um, so the, uh, I would, I'm, I'm going to put on my, my tinfoil hat, my crystal ball, all that for just a second, guys. I think we're going to see some disinflation here in the second quarter of this year. Hmm. And that's going to be on base effects because inflation was so high last year, second quarter. Okay. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that go down second quarter this year. 
at that point, I wouldn't be surprised to see them cancel the interest rate increases that are scheduled during that time. And because we're coming up on midterm elections, we could start talking more stimulus, which is going to print more money, which could then drive to higher inflation. That's my own pet theory about what could happen. You, you see yeah. it. So are you saying you see another round of stimmy checks coming or no? I think so. Really? I think so. Because if, if, if it, if it, if the economy burps at all, can't have that coming up on the midterms. Mm. And all we look at is all we look at in, in this country is election cycles anymore. Right. We don't look at long-term yeah, and I mean, in fairness, you know, in fairness, Rich, I, I'm as critical as politicians as you are, brother. Yeah. But in the end, what they're really doing is reacting to the people. If the mm -hmm. people wanted long-term solutions, the politicians would go with it. Yeah. But they don't. They 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 want their they, they don't want to suffer any pain whatsoever. Yeah. So um that's my own little thing. So uh one last thought and then a trivia question. So uh there's a CNBC article that'll be in the show notes, guys, and it says uh, hourly wages were up 4.7%. But that was a 2.3 decrease in purchasing power. The inflation was up 7% in December. So as you're reading the headlines, guys, really look at, really look at all the information because every source will push one thing or another. Well, and, and you know, this, this is another thing I try to teach my kids. It's like, uh, Dad, that's a big building. Well, relative to what? Dad, that's mm -hmm. high inflation. Relative to what? That's a great interest rate. Relative yep. to what? Uh, you know, you can't get stuck in looking at this piece of information in isolation because relative to what right. uh, is something that we all need to be asking ourselves. Yep. And like hey. you said, when they change mm -hmm. the goalposts and then retool the metrics to give you a different outcome yeah. or to make it look like there's a different outcome, mm -hmm. you know, we're, well, we need to be you, aware of that. You do you do building stuff and and home improvement stuff there at the farm, right, Rich? Mm -hmm. I do some basic carpentry stuff. How good a carpenters would we be if every time you grabbed the tape measure, it was different? Oh my God! Yeah, you, you couldn't. It'd be impossible. It would be right? impossible. And I've talked about this before. Uh, have you, my dad showed me a. He worked for a Japanese conveyor company for I don't know ten or twenty years. And he showed me a measuring tape one time. He says, take a look at this. I pull it out, look at it. I'm like, okay. I hand it back to him. He's like, no, no, look at it again. I look at it. I'm like, okay, it's a measuring tape. And he goes, is it? I said, yeah, look. It says an inch is two inch, three inch. He's like, that's a Japanese inch. And it's like seven eighths of an American inch. Really? Yeah. So it said, so when these Japanese would fly into a job site, he's like, you got to make sure, pat them down for those, <laughs> you know, because if, if they've got the wrong one, they're like, oh, no, I, I cut it seven inches. <laughs> it's, it's wrong. But that that's the case, man. It's yeah. How you measure things yep. is incredibly important. Absolutely. So, all right. So speaking of how you measure things, I got a trivia question. And oh, see if anybody can get this one. Okay. All right. So this is a quote. So who said it? And for bonus points, what year? Okay. okay. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth. Well, I'm reading your show notes, so I know who it was. <laughs> but anybody else out there know who said that? We should have some Jeopardy music getting piped in right about now. Ah, ah Ted, Ted nailed it. Greenspan. For bonus points, what year do you know, Ted? Hmm. Warm, but no. No, oh, it was it was Alan Greenspan was Alan who Greenspan. became chairman of the Fed, the maestro. So he <laughs> went from advocating for a gold standard in oh, very close to that. It was 1966. Yeah. Um. So he went from basically advocating for a gold standard in 1966 to being in charge of the Fed in 80 something. I think he came in after Volcker, I believe. Yeah. Um. So it would have been the 82 ish somewhere in there, all the way through just before the dot com bubble burst. It's well, funny how those Fed chairs always get out right before the bubble bursts. I know, it? weird, huh? Yeah, wow. That's but some market it, timing right there. You could also say that Paul Volcker te teed him up pretty well for him to come mm -hmm. in and 
Absolutely. Yeah. So something to think about, guys. When you get somebody like Alan Greenspan, who was advocating for a gold standard before the inflation of the 70s and then goes completely the other way and is essentially plays for the other team, devaluing the dollar. Something to think about. It is. Uh, anything else before we wrap up today? Um, uh, Bob asks if uh, Ted wins a wheelbarrow of Zimbabwe cash. No, he gets two rounds and nine mil. <laughs> about the same. <laughs> about the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, no, that's all I got, brother. All right. Well, guys, remember the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>